Okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Um, just as a reminder, this is the sub-seasonal to seasonal um, aspect of the two split out groups. If you're looking for the novel uh, usage event plus, that'll be the other one, the plenary group. Um, so you can just find that in the agenda. I'm going to um, send an in-chat message to everybody. Um, uh, I'm going to send a link off to the, the Google Docs that has the day one um, abstracts. So if you want to read on this, by all means. Um, let's get this one started. I'll deal, um, Marion, if the link isn't working, I'll work with you on the side on that one. But let's um, keep this rolling. rolling. Um, to begin to kick things off, um, Shannon, you're going to lead the presentation with the sub-seasonal to seasonal verification for EMC verification system. And at your leisure, uh, please take it away. Yeah, just let me pull up my slides here. All right, just wanting to confirm that you can hear and hear me and see my slides. Yep, we can see you and your slides are good. All right, sounds good. All right, so hi everyone, I'm Shannon Shields. I'm a member of the Model Evaluation Group at the Environmental Modeling Center. And I'll be talking about the sub-seasonal, the seasonal verification for the Environmental Modeling Center verification system, which you heard Jason Levitt talk about earlier as a, a more grand overview and. I'll be covering the components for S2S here. And I'd like to acknowledge my fellow team members, <clears throat> Alicia Bentley and Jeff Manikin, for their assistance in helping to plan and organize the S2S components for EBS. So first, I'll give a brief overview and introduction, including the subseasonal and seasonal components. And then I'll be going over um, some flowcharts for MetaMet Plus tools and showing how I use those tools in my work. I'll then be going over just some very brief and initial example plots, just give uh, brief uh, examples of what plots um, could be, will be looking like um, for S2S components and EVS in general. And then lastly, I'll talk about future work um, that we plan on doing for EVS system. So first, just to give an overview and an introduction here, uh, global model verification on the sub-season, low-seasonal timescale is in development for the EMC verification system, also called the EVS. We're going to be using MET version 10.1.1 and MET Plus version 4.1.1, as well as Python scripts to generate statistics and plots for the EVS. The EMC Verif Global Package, which is EMC's MET Plus based global deterministic model verification package, was used as a baseline for setting up the S2S components. Also, variables and metrics vetted by the UFS community from uh, what was mentioned before with the uh, verification uh, metrics workshop uh, will be computed for numerous domains, as well as, of course, um, numerous. Um, Time, time domains based on sub-seasonal and seasonal timescales. So uh, I'll be going that here now with a little bit more depth um, here for sub-seasonal verification, in which this component will consist of grid to grid as well as grid to obs verification. Models are going to include the global ensemble forecast system as well as the climate forecast system. The model's own climatology will be used in the verification of anomalies, and that includes variables such as fire and hectopascal geopotential height, meter temperature and precipitation. Other variables, uh, just to give uh, a brief list here, this is not exhaustive, there are many more variables than this, but just to give an example of some variables that we will be uh, verifying for the subseasonal component here for the EVS. Those include the standardized precipitation index, the polymer drought severity index, fire danger index, NAO slash PNA index, the Arctic oscillation and Arctic oscillation index, as well as some sea ice parameters, such as sea ice concentration, sea ice edge, and sea ice thickness. So a little bit more info on the subseasonal component. Um, the domains are going to include east, west, central, and southern CONUS, as well as CONUS uh, overall. Alaska, Hawaii, North America, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, tropics, as well as a global domain. Temporal coverage <clears throat> will be daily. So that will be days 1 to 35, uh, and, as, and that will be, of course, for both GAFs and CFS here, but that really takes advantage of the GAFs um, going out to 35 days, with GAFs be 12, um, as well as a weekly temporal coverage, which that, for example, is going to be days 1 to 7, days 8 to 14, and so forth. 
uh, monthly, which is 30 days, days six to 10, and lastly, weeks three to four. Metrics are variable dependent, so um, each variable um, has different metrics assigned to it that we will be computing um, for verification. But just to give some examples here, again, not an exhaustive list, but just to give some examples, that will consist of Heidke skill score, group mean square error, bias, uh, anomaly correlation coefficient, equitable threat score, and fraction skill score for precipitation, as well as performance diagrams. And then moving on to the seasonal component of verification for the EBS, that will also consist of grid to grid and grid to ops verification. Model is just going to include the CFS um, since it is a seasonal model here. And that will eventually become um, in the future the seasonal forecast system or the SFS. The CFS climatology will be used um, in the verification anomalies as in the subseasonal component that's going to be including 500 hectopascal geopencil height, temperature, and precipitation. And the variables are going to be similar as in the subseasonal component um, for the seasonal verification as well. But the seasonal verification is also going to include snow accumulation, and that's both monthly and for the winter season, basin-wide tropical cyclone counts, zero to 10 centimeters soil moisture and temperature, and the East Asian summer monsoon index. The domains are uh, pretty similar. There's a few differences between subseasonal and seasonal. For the seasonal verification, the domains are going to include east, west, central CONUS, CONUS in general, as well as uh, similar to the previous slide with Alaska, Hawaii, North America, Southern and Northern Hemisphere, tropics, as well as index regions such as for the ENSO and NAO and PNA. Uh, temporal coverage will be weekly. That's again days like one to seven, days eight to fourteen, and so forth. Monthly thirty days, and of course being seasonal verification on a seasonal scale of three monthly scale. So that will be like June, July, and August for the summer. So metrics are again variable dependent, but um, to give an example, and they will mainly consist of HiQ skill score, RMSE, bias, and ACC. And so this is um, the MET flow chart here with the tools that we've seen previously in previous sessions. Um, this is just going to be giving an example of the MET plus and MET, MET tools that um, I use um, for some specific cases here. Um, this is going to be showing a grid to grid case, for example. So we start off, you can see on the far left uh, with the red circles, um, you start off with the gridded forecast data set. So for the subseasonal, component of verification for the EVS that is going to be the GEFs and CFS. For seasonal, that will just be the CFS. And then, of course, with uh, the gridded analysis data set as well, the verify against, and that, for example, um, for the most variables is going to be GFS analysis. If you take the forecast data, um, in this particular example that I'm showing, I read it into the Genons prod tool uh, to get the ensemble mean. And that outputs it into a gridded net CDF data file. And then that gridded net CDF data file with the ensemble mean forecast data uh, is then read into GridStat as well as the original um, analysis data. And then GridStat computes the output line types for statistics. And then that outputs it into uh, .stat files and uh, ASCII text files. And then we run through that process um, for different lead times, um, the different models for subseasonal and seasonal components, and uh, different. And we run through all that, and then we aggregate that together um, using stat analysis. And then outputs um, stat analysis outputs a .stat file as well, and ASCII text files too. And we use that those stat files that are output from stat analysis. We're going to be using those and using Python plotting uh, to generate plots. So this is showing a grid OBS case. And so again, we start off on the far left with the gridded forecast data. Um, again, uh, depending on whether it's subseason or seasonal, that's going to be GAPS and or CFS. And then we, um, in this case, since it's OBS, uh, grid OBS case, we are using uh, buffer point data. So that, for example, is going to be uh, NAM or RAP buffer data. And so we read in, um, starting at the top here, um, again, as in the grid-to-grid -grid case, um, for this particular example that I'm showing here, um, gridded forecast data um, into the Genons prod tool. That's, for example, of course, like I said before, to get like the ensemble mean. 
and then that gets uh, generates the gridded net CDF data file. And then with the observations, uh, with the buffer data, we read that into the PB2NC tool. The buffer data is converted into a NetCDF um, output file. And then both of those NetCDF files for the forecast and the observations uh, slash analysis is then read into the PointStat tool. The output line types of those statistics are generated using that tool. And then that outputs, again, the stat and ASCII files. Again, we run through that process as often as we need to to generate all the lead times. And then we aggregate together using stat analysis. And that outputs, again, the stat and ASCII files. We use the .stat output files to then uh, generate plots using Python. So these are just very brief initial example plots. Um, obviously, this is definitely not what's going to be, uh, what the plots are not going to look like this per se for EVS, but it's to give a brief um, initial idea. Um, and this is just showing for the GEFS mean, but obviously for the subseasonal verification, it will be showing the GEFS mean with the spread as well as the CFS model. Uh, but this is just showing GEFS mean on these plots here. And then for the seasonal component, these plots will be showing the CFS model. So um, what will be, uh, you know, as shown here, though, that will follow through with the final uh, EVS plots is we're going to have the logos on the top as shown here, and then a uh, title um, listing the metric and the domain and variable. So here we're showing the anomaly correlation coefficient uh, for 500 hectopascale geopotential height. Um, for the valid dates of June 1st of last year through the 31st of July of last year. Uh, and these are for zero Z initializations and valid times. On the upper left is for the Northern Hemisphere domain, and the upper right is for the Southern Hemisphere domain, and the bottom is for the tropics. So again, this is just showing the GEFS mean uh, plotted here with the y-axis showing the ACC mean versus the forecast hour lead time. And these are the just a reminder that uh, you have two minutes left. Okay. And so uh, this will be an example in which we're going to have the mean versus the forecast lead time uh, generated for EVS. So uh, these are just two more examples of uh, plots, just to give you a brief initial idea where we are going to be generating uh, plots for bias, as shown on the left here, uh, for two meter temperature and CONUS domain. Uh, this is for January 2022 dates. And then as well as for mean square error on the right. So future work um, for EVS, and in particular for the S2S components, um, we're hoping to utilize MetCalcPy and MetPlotPy in the future uh, to calculate and plot certain S2S metrics, especially for commonly used indices. Um, after EVS version one, um, after our alpha test, the plan is for future versions to include variables related to groundwater, stream flow, and atmosphere coupling, and integrated water vapor transport. The CPC precipitation analysis might be added to EVS version two uh, to verify precipitation over global domains. Currently, we are going to be using CCPA and MRMS QPE uh, in EVS version one. And with that, I'll take any questions. And thank you for your time and attention. And I'll go back to the main screen here and stop presenting so I can see if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, is there anybody who has any questions? If you want to raise a hand, we've got about two minutes for questions. Uh, Timothy. Hi, Shannon. That's a really nice talk, by the way. Um, just Thanks. one question. When I looked at those anomaly correlations between the hemispheres, northern versus southern, I noticed that the, the northern hemisphere ended up around 0.3 at the long lead times, while the southern hemisphere ended up around 0.1. Do you think that's just due to the particular situation models are trying to forecast or some kind of a hemispheric difference? Um, so, yeah, so those are initial, like I said, um, we did, I did vet them against like our old system of VSDB and uh, those values like did match up. So like those should be, you know, correct against our VSDB system. For the bias RMSE plots, those weren't vetted yet. They were just initial. Um, but for the ACC, um, I think it is just a, a difference in hemispheres. I know that, yeah, you look at the Northern Hemisphere and they end up dropping off at, you know, the different kind of levels for the ACC mean. So um, I haven't dug into it like that much um, to say, but I think that, yeah, it's probably 
related to um, the hemispheres and also that was for a particular time frame. It wasn't for the whole summer season, it was the June and July dates. So it might be kind of a date dependent and what processes were occurring at that time as well. Hey, thank, thank you. Yep, thanks. Is there anybody else who has a quick question? Otherwise we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, yes, Carlos. Yes, we can hear you. Um, just a uh, quick question. Uh, when you say temporal coverage, would it be the uh, time of the initialization or the time of the forecast? Right. Yeah. Um. So I'm. I'm. That would be the time of the forecast. That would be the lead times. Yes. We're we're going to be verifying the you know zero six twelve eighteen z. We're going to be including that as the model initialization times. But yeah, when I'm talking about the temporal coverage on those particular sides for subseasonal and seasonal, that will be the subseasonal and seasonal temporal coverage lead times, forecast hour lead times that we are going to be looking at. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shannon, for answering all those questions. If anybody has additional questions, I encourage you to put them in the comments, and I hope that Shannon is able to attend to them. Um, in the interest of time, though, if John, if you want to start presenting, already on it, of course. Uh, our next presenter is John Infanti, and they'll be presenting on the use of MetPlus to evaluate monthly CFS v2 data at the Climate Prediction Center. John, whatever you want, take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yep, I can hear you good. Excellent. So I'm very excited to be going after Shannon, actually, because I'm going to be talking about CFS v2 data as well, um, although on a monthly time scale, and uh, talking more about um, spatial maps and uh, probabilistic verification. So this is, I stole from the CPC website, uh, this is the MWS suite of official forecasts. Um, I'm going to be mostly uh, looking at this realm here on monthly and seasonal time scales more specifically looking at monthly, but all of the results that I have here can be expanded to seasonal. Um, and if you're interested, uh, we also have another talk from one of my CPC colleagues who will be talking about object verification of the week two cold hazard outlooks using MET, and that'll be the talk after this one. So this is an example of the official monthly outlooks that CPC issues. This was the monthly outlook that was issued on June 16th and was valid for July 2022 with the monthly temperature outlook on the left and the monthly precipitation outlook on the right. But in order to create these outlooks, the forecaster, of course, has to depend on multiple tools. Um, those tools can include dynamical models such as the CFS v2 and the North American Multimodel Ensemble, which includes CFS v2 data, uh, land surface states, the state and forecast of ENSO or an MJO, multiple statistical tools, and even more tools really depending on the time of year and active climate states. But of course, one of the tools that we use is CFS, as it's the operational NSEP dynamical model and provides forecasts of two meter temperature and precipitation, among other variables um, from, for a variety of lead types. So CFS is part of NMME. It's also used as a standalone model informing monthly and seasonal forecasts of CPC. So this is an example of uh, deterministic, so the en ensemble mean anomaly and probabilistic forecast of two meter temperature over North America. This is an example from June, 2021, and this would be something that's available to forecasters. So on the left here, this is the CFS monthly uh, two meter temperature forecast um, that would be initialized on 31st of May, 2021 and predicting June, 2021. And this is the probability forecast in terciles. Um, so that's taking all of the ensemble members. And then um, I believe this uses uh, 0.43 sigma levels to create these terciles that you see here. Uh, so this is just an example of one of the tools that we would use to create those outlooks that I showed a few slides ago. So of course, that means that verification of these tools and forecasts is important, um, both in real time and in hindcast. Um, so I've included an example of hindcast verification of CFS v2 precipitation and two meter temperature on the left hand side here. And this is done with anomaly correlation, which is just the correlation between observations and the model. And that's obviously deterministic. So typically we wanna include deterministic and probabilistic methods of analysis, as well as including hindcast and real time assessment of tools as that can aid in forecaster confidence when they're looking at these, um, these tools while they make the forecasts. 
Moreover, um, we want easily reproducible, consistent metrics for verifications and a way to easily test multiple metrics. So that's where MetPlus enters this equation. So through this proposal that was a JTTI proposal and is a joint proposal between NCAR and CPC um, to adapt and implement MetPlus verification and diagnostic framework um, to CPC to address the specialized needs of CPC subseasonal to seasonal forecasting as well as the other time scales that we work on, um, the hazardous time scale as well, which Justin will be talking about in a few moments after this talk. Um, and one of the goals of this proposal is to use traditional and object-based verification methods available in MetPlus to evaluate seasonal and subseasonal guidance, among other goals. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to do in order to implement MetPlus uh, successfully at CPC is to benchmark or vet some of the commonly used skill metrics that we use at CPC with how we typically compute them. So, you know, we compute them in Python or other programming languages versus output from Met, MetPlus. So getting the same results um, would, of course, increase confidence that MetPlus is doing the same things that we code, but more behind the scenes. So we chose two skill metrics to benchmark, um, Briar skill score and Hide key skill score. And for the benchmarking here, um, I used CFSV2 January initialized monthly two meter temperature at lead zero. And the only reason that I did that was just for simplicity in doing the, this benchmarking exercise. So the scientific results that I'll be showing aren't all that interesting, um, but I will note that you can expand any of these results to other lead times, um, variables, domains, um, seasonally, or even other models. And we're hoping that to ex expand this to multi-model as well. So throughout this process and working on this joint proposal, um, we did have a few what I'm going to call gotchas here. Um, so of course, at CPC, we speak what I'm going to call climatologist ease, and we needed to translate that language and methods to MetPlus. Similarly, the MetPlus team needed to translate to CPC. Um, so that was a fun time throughout this entire process. Um, CPC sometimes uses special versions of metrics for verification, such as high-key skill score, which we'll be talking about later. Um, we needed to adapt to MetPlus and be able to use MetPlus for tercile-based forecasts and the fact that our data were organized such that all ensemble members were in one file, which originally was difficult to do in Met. And for these timescales, of course, you all know, um, as Shannon was saying as well, we removed the model climatology from the model forecast or hindcast and the observed climatology from observations which initially wasn't an easy capability in MetPlus. Um, so on the right-hand side here, I have my 61 uh, email chain with John as we were going through this benchmarking process <laughs> with CFS, um, starting with, hey, I'm trying to figure out how to attack this, and then ending with, I think I got it, <laughs> in, in all caps at the end. All right, so we're, I'm going to start with Briar skill score here. And we calculated Briar skill score um, in a three category system um, or a tercile system that needed to be matched in MetPlus. I'm not going to go through these steps in super huge amounts of detail, um, but basically, uh, what we needed to do was to do all of these steps within MetPlus instead of using a Python wrapper or et cetera. Um, so that's one of the goals that we had here. Um, we also needed to calculate CFS V2 probabilities, calculate the observed category, calculate the Briar score of the forecast, and calculate our climatological reference Briar score. And in the case of CPC, um, the climatological reference Briar score assumes there's a climatological probability of 0 0.33 in a tercile system. So in other words, that would be a 33% chance that a forecast would fall into each of the categories by chance. And to do all that within Met, get it to match my Python output. So that's how we did this. Um, essentially, what we did was CPC or, or me plotted Briar, uh, Briar skill score in Python for the same time period and model and variable that NCAR used uh, MetPlus to calculate the Briar skill score. Um, so we ended up doing this successfully, kind of a spoiler, um, but uh, these are the MET steps that are included. 
Um, the first step in order to do this entirely in MET from raw CFSV2 data that hasn't been created into hasn't been made into probabilities, just ensemble data. You would ingest a CFSV2 ensemble forecast uh, with all of the ensemble members in a single file for any given year, and you do that for 29 years. And then you run series analysis 24 times, one for each ensemble member of CFSV2 across the entire 29 years of forecast data. That gives you climatology for CFS. Then you take the resulting output that came out of series analysis and you put that into Gen Ons Prod, which is called 29 times, um, once for each year. That's how much data we had. I, I probably should have mentioned this Hindcast data set was 1982 to 2010. And if I, apo I apologize if I did not mention that. Um, and then from there, Gen Ons Prod uses the normalize option and um, series analysis is used to output uh, to normalize and output the ensemble members relative to the model climatology and standard deviation. And then from Gen Ons Prod, there are 29 files containing uncalibrated probability forecasts for the lower tercile of January for each year. And the reason it's the lower tercile is just because that's what we're using as an example here. Uh, the forecast to observation verification, which is the last step during the Briar skill score step, um, is then completed across both the temporal and spatial scales. And then we do this final probability verification across the temporal scale in series analysis and across the spatial scale in grade stat. And BSS is output at this step. But this is the plot you've all been waiting for. And I, I know it might be a little bit boring to look at, but this was the most satisfying plot that I've ever made in my entire life. On the left-hand side is the output for 1982 to 2010, high, uh, I'm sorry, Briar skill score. Um, for my internal Python code for January CFS lower tercile T mean versus MET plus on the right. And I know these images look exactly the same, but that's exactly what we wanted. Um, we got, you know, everything done in MET plus, starting with uh, just raw ensemble members of CFS, creating the probabilities, and then verifying the lower tercile, in this case, prior skill score. There is a use case. I have the link here. I don't expect you all to be able to copy this as fast as I'll go through it, but if you want the link, I can provide it for you. And then really quickly, I'm going to move on to high key skill score um, because it is a very widely used metric at CPC, um, but we use a simplified version of high key skill score for tercils. Um, so on the left hand side of this slide is the traditional for uh, the traditional version. So you can see this C2 value has um, a lot of things that are coming into it. The N11 and N00 are from a contingency table. N11 would mean a forecast that is falling into a given category and, and the ops are falling into a given category or a hit. N00 is forecasts are, um, oh, sorry, I, I actually wrote this incorrectly. I think this is the correct negative, but um, forecasts are not uh, predicting a given category and OBS are also not predicting a given category. And then T is the total number of forecast or OBS pairs or grid points. Um, in the traditional version. Uh, John, have... just a reminder, you got two minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, C2 is this longer version, where in CPC um, we use a much shorter version of the C2 value, which is just a simple, um, we expect a third of the grid points would fall into the correct category. Um, this, in this case, we used a Python wrapper combined with MET plus, as opposed to doing all of the steps within MET plus. Um, and to do that, what we did was use a Python wrapper to calculate, um, the dominant tercile category for CFS V2, as well as, um, the OBS category. Basically what we did is create like a field of one, two, or three, where one is the lower tercile, two is the middle tercile, and three is the upper tercile. And then from there, um, we feed the all of that data into MET Plus and use grid stat to calculate high key skill score over all CONUS grid points for each year. Um, so it seems like an extra step based on the last uh, use case, but it's a super powerful way of pre-processing the data, pre-processing the data prior to using MET Plus to anal analyze it. Um, so this was a really great way to go. And again, this might look like a boring plot. But the blue lines here are the high key skill score calculated from Python, and red is from MET plus. And you can see that this matches through and through. So um, not only did we use the CPC specialized version of high, high key skill score, but we got everything matching 
using the Python wrapper and everything with CPC. And then I have also included a second example here of current usage for week three, four sub X models. This is courtesy of Justin Hicks, where he's um, calculated height key skill score. And then finally, a summary and next steps. So successfully use MetPlus to calculate CFSB2 probabilities, verify using prior skill score, and benchmark those. Um, we've also successfully used Met, MetPlus and Python wrapper to pre process and find the dominant tersal category in CFS and calculate Heidke scale score using CPC's equation, which is called HSSEC and MetPlus. That use case is in progress. And the next steps are hopefully to expand to multi-model ensembles, week three, four, and seasonal data. And thank you to everyone who I've listed here and anyone who I may have missed, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Jana. Uh, if anybody has a question, we've got time for a question or two. Okay, looks like we're clear questions. Again, thanks, Jana, for presenting on that, especially for the work that uh, I was able to put in on it. Um, our next presentation is going to be Maria on the MetPlus use cases for sp space-time spectra and Hobmuller diagrams using UFS P5 and P7 model output. Um, looks like, yep, and we can see your slides, Maria, whenever you'd okay. like to start. Can you hear me too? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, yeah, as you just said, this is um, using MetPlus um, and making use cases for two um, recently added um, capabilities. And um, this is very much a work in progress. So essentially what I did is I used some of the use cases were already in there and I adapted those to um, apply these to the UFS prototype 5 and prototype 7. And um, this uses um, the MetPlus um, Python wrappers. It uses exclusively MetCalpy and MetPlotPy. And the use cases that are already there are included in um, right here in the S2S model applications um, directory. And those already contain a basic use case for the half model plots and the um, cross vector plots that I'm going to show, but there is no use case in there yet for um, actually computing the cross vector. So that'll be um, added soon, hopefully. So, as I said, these are two use cases that are based on recently added um, diagnostics for tropical convective variability. And these are part of a um, standalone Python toolbox that we developed. But we wanted to make it very easy to actually use these during model development, for example. So we decided to also add this to MetPlus. Um, we'll be looking at precipitation and then zonal winds for these examples that I'm going to show. And I'm using error interim as verification just because it was already on HERA and I didn't have to deal with adding extra data sets. Um, ideally, of course, you, for a real application, you would want to use observed precipitation. Um, I have this set up on Hera on one of the NOAA supercomputers, and I'm using um, version 10.1.1 of MET, 4.1.1 of MET plus, and then MET CalPy and MET plot Pi version 1.1.0. Um, I'm going to start with the half Muller diagrams. And these are time longitude plots of latitude averages. And here I'm going to be using these um, for precipitation in the tropic, tropics, so a tropical latitude band. Um, originally, these plots were developed to look at 500 hectopascal heights in the mid latitudes to help with um, weather prediction in the mid latitudes. Um, so, essentially, what you can see in the tropics is you can see the zonal propagation of large scale convective features. Um, and the command to run this use case is very simple. And what you need is you need the config file, and then you need the YAML file with the plot parameters. And then you also need the input net CDF file that contains the precipitation data you want. And I apologize for the really small um, script for the user script on the left here. Um, but I'm going to go through this. Um, so the user script command 
is um, just points to the unmodified Python script that's included with metplotpy. And then the other thing you need is um, further down is you need the input file name, which contains the precipitation data. And then you need to point to the correct um, YAML file. <clears throat> and the YAML file I'm using here is um, this um, center panel. And essentially what this one does is um, it sets the title for your plot, font size, um, start date, end date for your plot, um, the variable name that's in the file. So the Python script actually reads this and it gets the variable variable name in the netcdf file from this script. And then you can set the output file name, color scale, and all those things. Um, so what I did is I actually ran this three times. As you can see on the left, I have a couple of lines um, commented. So I ran it once for each prototype precipitation, and then I have ran it a third time um, for the error interim. Um, I also have three YAML files, just so I only have to edit the config file between my runs. We could have used the same YAML file, but then I would have had to edit two files. And then, um, Oh yeah, and then you, the last thing you need to do is you need to point to the correct mod, uh, matplotpy location at the bottom here of the config file. Um, so you can edit all of these things. Um, and I noticed while I was doing this that some of these settings are not actually being read by the Python file. So there will be some um, changes um, we can hopefully make in the future to make, make sure that the height and the width and the title are actually read in by the Python file. Um, and this is what it, it looks like when you do that. The time starts on the bottom here for all three plots. Longitude is the x-axis. And you can see that at the very beginning of each forecast, the model forecast looks very similar to the error interim precipitation. Um, I think it would be better if I could change the aspect ratio of these to make them longer in time and just make these plots look nicer. Um, but what you can see is that there are different prototypes. There's very good agreement at the beginning of the forecast. And then very quickly, the forecast, each of these forecasts um, decorrelates from the observations. Um, and if you look at it closely, that it looks like the prototype seven appears to have some more light precipitation than prototype five and maybe less well-defined diurnal cycle over South America. And South America is over here at longitude, um, just east of longitude 300. The next use case is looking at the space-time spectra. And what these are, these are essentially two-dimensional power and cross spectra in frequency and zonal wave number. And usually um, what people do is they compute these at each latitude in the latitude band, for example, 10 south to 10 north, and then they average those to get the symmetric or anti-symmetric across the equator. Um, and this is going to um, be done in two steps. Um, first, we have to compute the spectra, and then we have to plot the output. And um, again, each of the for each of those steps, the command is very simple. You um, it's just the run mid plus that pi, um, and then the user configuration script. And uh, again, we need the config script, a YAML file, and then the input file names to compute the cross spectra. And for plotting, we also need the config file, a different config file in this case, different YAML file with all the plotting parameters, and then the input file names that came out of the running um, the first command up here. So to compute these, uh, again, I have the user script, um, the config file, and then the YAML file here. And what you need to do is, um, in this case, I actually used an, the edited Python script. So I copied over the Python script that comes with metcalpy in this instance, and then edited that. And then I call this in a slightly different fashion because I had to edit the 
the Python command into this into the user script command here. Um, and what I did is for the YAML file, I, was, I had to change this, edit the Python file because I had to, some of these parameters were hard coded into the Python script because it's um, still pretty fresh. And I made it so that you can actually change, just change the YAML file instead of having to change the Python file to change these um, parameters. And again, you need to point to the metcalpy location on Hera. And um, in the YAML file, you can change the model name, which is for the output file name, is being used for the output file name, um, the parameters to compute the spectra, and again, the start and end dates. And when you run this, you end up with a NetCDF file that contains the cross-spectral components. And then the next step then is to actually plot these. And this, again, is set up with a different config file and a different YAML file. The YAML file in this instance is um, pretty sparse. I, I just have four entries in there. Um, the config file, again, you want the user script command. And in this case, I also had to edit the Python script a little bit. So I'm pointing to my own edited Python script. Um, and you need the input file names. It's, it's just a list, comma separated list. And you need to point to the metplotpy directory and to the YAML config file. And then what this does is um, creates um, a panel plot of the coherent spectra in this case. And what the coherent spectra show, and this is what it looks like, what the coherence spectra shows is this is coherence between precipitation and zonal wind at two different levels for each model. And it shows you where you have higher levels of coherence. It shows you where the model dynamics and model precipitation vary um, coherently. So you have some coupling between the dynamics and the um, convection. And what you can see is that the prototype 7 has stronger convection dynamic coupling than the UFS um, P5. And I'm not showing the observations here, but um, P7 is actually more consistent with observations. So that's a good thing. Um, in the future, I think it would be good to add some more flexibility to these plotting tools. Um, so that there's a lot of settings in the YAML file that can be edited easily and the, um, the um, Python script just reads those in. Um, okay, to Maria, summarize. Just, uh, remind, yep, we got about two minutes. Perfect, very good. Um, first of all, I need to thank all the Met team members that helped me with this because I had a lot of help <laughs> to do to set this up on Hera and ran into a lot of issues that I got help with. Um, I showed the scripts. I'm happy to share the scripts. I'm happy to share the um, my edited Python scripts if anybody's interested in. Um, looking at the, looking at these, um, I showed these for the half model diagrams. Um, I also set up some scripts to compute the cross spectral analysis and then plot the space time coherence spectra. Um, in the future, I think it would be good to be able to um, set up a script to run multiple half models in one, um, just one run. I just didn't know how to do that, and I figured it's keeping it simple for now, and then I can figure out how to do that later. And then also would be um, very helpful for this to be able to loop through all initial initial dates for this for the UFS prototypes uh, because right now this was just for one single initial date and then to add more flexibility to the plotting scripts so the number of panels number of input files and then also in addition to the coherence spectra plot the power spectra um, all of that and the last thing I wanted to say is that I used pre-processed um, UFS output, where I made one single file for one input date um, with all the lead times and just one variable. And I think ideally that should also be done in the MET plus framework, um, that pre-processing so that it can be, all those um, dates should be read on the fly. We don't have to have this extra pre-processing step. Um, yeah, with that, um, Thank you, uh, thank you for listening, and thanks to the Met team for a lot of help on this. 
All right, thank you, Maria. Um, we do have some time for some questions. If anybody has any, please feel free to raise your hand. We'll we'll discuss them. Uh, yes, Tara. Yeah, first off, a, a comment, um, Maria. Thank you so much for um, you know exer basically exercising these capabilities um, that have been added to Met Plus, so that we can get the great feedback that you just provided um, through this. That's you know one of the the challenges of um, trying to add in capabilities. We we need people to use it also, um, and then let us know what what's needed. So um, once again, thank you for that. Um, and then you mentioned that there wasn't a use case for the cross um, spectra um, plotting, but I was looking at the, the Met Plus user's guide and, and it appears that we do have one. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. No, sorry. The plotting is in there, but the computing of the cross spectra is Oh, not okay. Yeah. That, and that's why I was a little confused. I'm like, well, what are yeah. we missing? So, okay, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, looks like we're good. Um, again, thank you, Maria, for the presentation. Uh, move on to the next one. Looks like the slides are all queued up. This is uh, Justin Hicks um, presenting on the object verification of the CPC Week 2 US Cold Hazard Outlooks using the Met Mode tool. Justin, I can see your slides. Uh, if you want to start. Sure, appreciate that, John. Uh, so like John said, I will be talking about object verification of the Climate Prediction Center Week 2 US Cold Hazard Outlooks using the Met Plus Mode tool. I'm going to jump right into this because this is pretty lengthy. Um, so the purpose of the Week 2 US Hazard Outlooks is to forecast hazardous weather events um, at, at a lead time of two weeks. Uh, currently, these hazard forecasts are not verified, and we haven't assessed uh, their skill. And um, it's important to do so because of understanding the strengths and weaknesses in uh, the Week 2 hazard forecasting. Um, so this data set we're using has a special resolution of a half degree by half degree. It's a graded data, uh, data set, um, and it has the outlooks from days um, or leads 8 to 14, so in the entirety of Week 2. And we are looking to verify from uh, late 2014 to present day, and we'll have this running uh, in, in real time. Uh, the image in the upper right here, uh, this, is show, this is an older example of uh, week two hazard outlook. Um, it has three different contour areas. Each contour area, starting with the lightest blue, is a different risk prob probabilistic area. So the lightest blue is a slight risk or 20% chance. Uh, the medium blue color is a 40% chance or moderate risk. And the darker blue is a 60% chance or a high risk. Uh, and these are the outlooks for the cold hazards. And that's actually what we're going to be um, verifying in uh, well, for this presentation. We're just looking at the cold hazards, the cold hazard outlooks for now and verifying those. Uh, the image below that is just the same uh, image, just reproduced. Um, uh, I think this is probably a Python image. So our verification data set, uh, we're using Iowa State University uh, and, and NWS valid time extent codes archive data set, uh, which contains a, an historical record of NWS watches, warnings, and advisories, uh, which uh, can be shortened to Wawa. So if, if you hear me say Wawa, I'm not talking about the convenience store, but uh, the, the watches, warnings, and advisories. So, um, so these are used as a, as a proxy for observations of hazardous weather events. Uh, so this data set, the x, y dimensions match that of the hazards forecast for so it's, it's pretty consistent between the two. There's not much that we had to go in and do. So the image on the top left here, this is an older example of a uh, Wawa um, issued hazard map. Uh, this is the composite. So this contains all the different types of hazards, cold, um, extreme heat, uh, extreme precipitation, and so on. Uh, but we can subset that to just include the um, the cold wawas, which is on the top right hand side here in red. Um, and on the bottom here, this is just um, for the same uh, valid time period of January 12th, 2017. This is the day eight 
um, cold hazard forecast. So you can see that that, um, at least upon initial look, verifies pretty well. So these are all of the different um, types of wild well fields. So we have uh, much below normal temperatures on the left-hand side here, much above normal. Um, you know, what constitutes as heavy precipitation warnings, heavy snow, high winds. And uh, we're just taking a look at verifying the cold, um, cold hazard using the cold Wawa's uh, for now, but then we'll eventually apply the same process to the other hazard types using the same uh, Wawa fields. So why use the mode tool? Um, so at Climate Protection Center, we often employ hit-based verification skill scores, uh, like uh, Heidke skill score or HSS. And oftentimes, uh, this can result in a uh, lower skill score, um, like we did expect at longer lead times. But let's say that we have a forecasted hazard shape um, that is um, maybe not overlapping the observed hazard, but it might maybe the shape is right next to it. Using a hit-based verification skill score would yield a pretty low skill. But if we take into account object characteristics, um, then that might be a more objective way of determining um, how skillful our, our hazard forecasts actually are. So when I say um, object characteristics, I mean things um, like uh, the amount of area that the forecast versus observations take up, um, their orientation, um, kind of, you know, the, uh, the angle that the ship makes, uh, the intersection area between the forecast and the um, observation and so on. Uh, so this gives the user quite a bit of control to determine uh, what actually makes forecasts skillful. Um, so when we're, when we're saying skillful, um, how are we um, calculating that? We're able to place weights on the object characteristics that give us skill. But before we um, begin to look at some of the configuration files, there was just one slight issue. Uh, we noticed that the hazard forecast shapes tend to take up much more space um, as like number of grid points than the Wawa's do, uh, but have fewer total objects. Um, a lot of the Wawa shapes are, have kind of localized areas, whereas when we're drawing the um, hazard outlooks, they tend to be over larger areas and not, they don't include many local areas. Um, so this table here, this is just, this is from 2015 to 2021. Um, and so I'm breaking this up into the outlook risk probability. So 20, 40, and 60%. And the numbers in the table are referring to the number of days from 2015 to 2021, where either the forecast um, had more um, total grid points than the observations, uh, or the forecast had fewer grid points than the observations, or in the rare instance that they were completely equal. And then we, we can see that for all three of the risk uh, probabilities um, that um, we had more days where there were more forecasted uh, grid points than observed. So we're going to counter that by running the mode tool uh, twice. So on the first run through of mode, what we're doing is um, actually comparing the uh, the raw Wawa's to themselves and hope that there are um, some Wawa objects that are similar enough to, um, to other Wawa objects to the point where we can cluster them together as just one total object. And so like I mentioned before, um, the user is able to determine um, different interest uh, weights. So since we're comparing the Wawa's to themselves and we want to combine Wawa's that are close to each other, we can place higher weights on attributes uh, such as uh, convex hull distances between two objects or the boundary distance between two objects, um, as well as the centroid distance. Uh, so the centroid is just essentially the middle <laughs> of an object. The boundary, if we if our object looks like a star here, the boundary is just the edge of that star, and the convex hull is the shortest distance that incorporates every single point um, along that boundary, which is the green line here. <clears throat> we can also, um, actually, let me get this one here. We can also change the interest functions, which are also called the interest maps. And what this is telling us is um, when we change the interest functions, we're able to um, tell MetPlus what values are of interest for each pairwise attribute measured. So if I'm looking at the centroid distance between two objects, if the centroid distance is zero between the two objects, um, that 
I could tell Matt that I want uh, Matplus to give an interest value of one. Whereas if, um, let's say, the centroid distance is uh, you know 10 grid spaces between the two objects, I can tell Matplus to uh, give those two object object pairs uh, an interest value of, of zero. So these are two, between the interest functions and the weights, these are uh, two things that we still need to fine tune. So from the very first run through of uh, the mode tool, this is just one example of the Wawa's from February 3rd, uh, 2018. Um, the objects that were clustered together um, are span from the mid-Atlantic to the northeast here. It's kind of hard to see, but it's this light blue color. So these three objects are found to be similar enough to one another, um, essentially in space. So they're close enough to one another to cluster together as a single object. Um, in this table on the kind of the right hand side of the side of the image, this is just comparing um, uh, each object uh, to one another and then applying an interest score. So this is just a blown up image here of what I just showed and images for, or the objects from the mid-Atlantic to the northeast are close enough to one another to cluster. Um, now we want we, what we want to do is this black outlined area that's surrounding uh, these this new clustered object is the convex hull of the new object. So we want to take that new convex hull and we want to fill in everything inside of the convex hull. So um, the vertices of this of all of these convex holes are fed into uh, Python, and I'm able to fill in all of the uh, grid points within that co uh, convex hole. And then these are the new uh, Wawa objects that are fed in to the final Metplus configuration file for uh, final verification. So we revisit that table from before. Uh, we can see that the new Wawa areas take up a little bit more space uh, and to kind of compare at least a little bit better to the forecasted um, hazard outlooks than they did before. Still not perfect, but uh, it's good to see that, you know, essentially if we had a 50% or so outlook risk probability, then we'd have a similar number of days uh, where the forecast, uh, where we had more forecasted grid points than OBS grid points or uh, vice versa. So the second run through of the configuration file, this is for final verification, where we have our, our week two hazard forecasts and our new Wawa areas here. Uh, so now we don't, we care, we still care about the distance between uh, uh, different objects, but we also care about um, how uh, shapes are intersecting one another if they're sharing the same area. And so we're placing more weight this time on the intersection area ratio between um, two objects and also just the total area that, that the objects are um, are taking up as well. And then we're still placing some weight on convex hull distance and the centroid distance as well. Again, this is something that we could go back and, and, and fine tune. Uh, before we get to results, this is just the, um, the flow chart that we've been showing. So we start again with the graded forecast data and the um, analysis data. And we feed that into the node tool, which outputs an ASCII, a NetCDF file, and the PostScript file. Uh, what's not shown here is the um, intermediate um, Python script that we're running to fill in that new convex hull. Um, and instead of having that new Py uh, or the separate Python script, what we can do uh, later on is just embed that into the second uh, node run so that we don't have three different processes, but rather we have two. Justin, just to remind you, you got two minutes. Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, so this is um, the example from, uh, this is verifying the uh, week two hazard again from February 3rd of uh, 2018 using the new uh, Wawa area for the uh, slight risk, the moderate risk, and the high risk. So you can see again in this uh, table in the upper right hand part of the image that we have um, interest values between each forecast and an observed object pair. Um, this doesn't really uh, constitute as a skill score. So what we can do is we can take all of these interest values and um, compute a single, um, essentially skill score that's called MMI. And that stands for uh, the median of maximum interest. I'm not gonna get into how that's calculated due to, uh, to the uh, time constraint here. Uh, but if you'd like to look this over and uh, understand how MMI is calculated, um, you can do that kind of in your own time. 
Um, but between um, verifying the slight, uh, moderate, and high risk uh, week two hazard forecast, uh, at least in this example, the, uh, the moderate um, risk forecast performed the best in terms of the MMI metric here. So, so far, we've uh, verified the week two cold hazards for all uh, leads 8 to 14 from late 2014 to present for each probabilistic area. Uh, we have this verification running in near real time as well. And we've gathered all of the MMI values as well um, as each of the interest values for each object pair. Uh, in the future, we want to fine tune the interest weights and the maps for each mode run and also verify the other hazard types such as high wind, above normal temps, heavy rain, heavy snow. And then finally, we'll post these verification results in near real time to a public web page. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any comments or questions. Thank you, Justin. Are there any questions or comments from the group at large? Feel free to raise your hand. OK. Sounds like we're good on that one. Thank you, Justin, for presenting. Um, to wrap up this session, uh, we have one final presentation. It's going to be from Nicholas Loveday. It's on using MetPlus to verify the Australian Bureau of Meteorology's heat wave service. Um, Nicholas is pulling up his slides. All right, Nicholas, whenever you're ready. Thanks, John. Um, hi, I'm Nick Loveday, and I'm a verification scientist at the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. Um, so to give you an update of, of where the bomb is at with using MetPlus, so we only really started using it um, for the first time in the last 12 months. Uh, so a few things that we've uh, worked through. So uh, recently we had around 20 to 30 uh, people within the bomb um, work through the recorded videos of the recent um, training sessions um, to try and uh, build a bit of a knowledge base within the, within the bomb. Um, we have uh, a project um, around uh, replacing all, all the old bespoke NWP verification systems with MetPlus, so um, pretty much all our routine verification um, in the future will be done primarily using MetPlus, um, and this is to, to become consistent with other um, Met offices, um, and it's also um, just one of the best tools out there. Um, the work so far that the people have done has really just been research and experimental work so far to, to test out MetPlus. So this has involved um, using it to, to verify um, model upgrades to the, for the Bureau's access model. Um, and this has included verifying uh, the high resolution NWP and also ensemble verification. Um, and I've also used it for to verify the Bureau's heat wave forecasts, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about. So I've just um, displayed here um, which parts um, of, of MET we've used before, and in red. And in orange, um, there's, um, there's some of the other parts that we have um, really short-term plans to use in, in the near future. So moving on to heat waves. So um, for a bit of background, uh, the heat wave service runs for the warmest six months of the year. Um, it's based on the excess heat factor. Um, I won't go into the, the details, but I can provide a reference um, if you're interested in, in the, our heat wave service. Um, a heat wave period is, is a, a three-day period. Every afternoon, um, the forecast is issued um, for five lead times. And what we're interested in verifying is on this map that goes out to the public, we want to verify the severe and extreme areas. So we're not too interested in the low intensity areas. And what we want to know is how good is this forecast for someone just visually eyeballing the, the map. So we're, so this map is still useful for people even if the extreme area is just um, is offset slightly spatially. So for these reasons, uh, we want to use mode to do object-based verification. So um, 
as a starting point, um, I was given uh, two net CDF files, um, a forecast net CDF file and an observation net CDF file. Uh, these were, um, this was gridded data. Um, all the, the valid times um, were contained within that data and um, the lead time for the forecast, uh, there was a lead time dimension within the forecast net CDF. Um, so yeah, contained data for an entire season. It was in the Australian Elbers Equal Area Map Projection, and there was virtually no metadata in these net CDFs. So the steps that I had to go through to, to figure out how to get uh, mode to run were the following. To begin with, I um, installed Map Plus on a local Linux machine, um, and I did this within a Condor environment. Um, the first problem that I ran into was um, I discovered that that Mac um, only allows um, a limited number of map projections, so I had to uh, reproject um, to a lat long projection, and I did this in Python using RAO X-Array. Um, and then the next big problem was um, because the net CDFs had um, little to no uh, metadata, I needed to make them. Um, CF compliant, so um, that the so that Map Plus could could run them, um, and th this was a big challenge to begin with. But after poking around on uh, the GitHub page, I found um, in the, there was an issue around updating the requirements for CF compliant um, Net CDFs um, in the documentation. Um, and so that, that update in that 10.1 Met document, documentation was really helpful um, and, and solved my problems. And that was, I guess, a common theme that came out of um, people in the Bureau trying to play around with Met Plus for the first time, was trying to get their data in the right format that, that it could run. So there was a little bit of a learning curve, but once people figured it out, um, it wasn't too bad. And then finally, because all of the data was in, um, uh, two net CDFs. Um, I had to split up those net CDFs um, and write them onto to disk for each valid time and each lead time. And I did that using a, a Python script that I wrote. So um, basically, the, the the main tool within Met that I used was was the mode tool, and I used um, all all of the ASCII net CDFs and PostScript files that were output from it. In terms of my config settings, so I'm assuming um, you have a general understanding uh, of, of mode, so I'm not going to go into the details and the method of, of how mode actually works. Um, but the way that I set up my config file, I set it up to loop through the six months of daily data for the, the five lead times, used a convolution radius of, of five, which is relatively small, but the, um, the, the heat wave field was also um, spatially fairly smooth. Um, the thresholds I used were just to match the severe and extreme thresholds. I used the double threshold merging and a total interest score of, of 0 0.75. And down in the bottom right, um, I've got the, the weights that I applied to, to various attributes. Um, uh, inspecting the, the PostScript files, it wasn't too sensitive to, to what weights I, I, I used. So one of the first things I, I, I did was um, look at the distribution of object sizes um, for the forecasts and observations. So on the left um, are the severe objects, on the right are the extreme objects. Um, note that the x-axis are slightly different between the two and the y-axis is, is, is log scale. Um, so a couple of things that um, noticed straight away, um, there's a lot more uh, smaller objects than, than larger objects. And um, when looking at, at the extreme objects, uh, there's far more larger forecast extreme objects than observed stream objects. So it indicates um, that there's a bit of an over forecast bias there. <laughs> so to create some uh, verification scores, um, what I did was uh, create an area weighted contingency table from the output. Um, so with, with, with forecast, um, the, the area, like 
area of heat waves is is important. So the larger areas matter much more than a really tiny area on a map. And the way I calculated this was for the false alarm account, I um, just calculated the total area of the forecast objects that were not part of a cluster. And um, a cluster object is a set of one or more objects in one field which match a set of one or more objects in the other field. So uh, those two fields with the forecast and the observation fields. Um, and yeah, with, with the miscount, um, if it's just the total area of the observed objects that were not part of a cluster. And for the hit count, there are a few ways we could have gone about this. Um, so that, that hit count is, is the um, correct positives. Um, but I used the total area of observed objects which were part of a cluster. And the reason why I just used the area of the observed objects was because I didn't want to bring in areas of the forecast objects because if I did so, then it could mean that um, forecasters could start hedging their, their, their forecast by uh, um, deliberately forecasting a slightly larger area uh, to, to improve the hit counts. So this was done uh, using a Python script and it read both the, the net CDF and the object ASCII output um, to generate these results. So one of the things I did was uh, calculate performance diagrams um, for both the severe and extreme objects. Um, so you can see basically um, like the CSI is, is much higher for the severe objects than the extreme objects. So they, they're plotted for all five lead times. There's a little bit of an overforecast bias um, for the severe objects, but um, a, a rather more significant overforecast bias with the extreme objects. Um, now, to complement this, um, I wanted to calculate a skill score now um, as, as an accuracy metric. So I didn't want to use um, CSI since it, it, it didn't really, um, doesn't really match to, the, to our service definition, um, which um, basically aligns with that the misses and false alarms should be penalized equally. And with CSI, um, sometimes it rewards bias forecasts, which I, I didn't want for our accuracy metric. So it's a really simple uh, skill score um, that basically um, is just one minus uh, the misses and plus false alarms divided by the reference forecast penalty. So for the reference forecast, um, it's just a forecast that never produces heat wave conditions. Um, so it's like we didn't have a heat wave service. Um, and this is also um, the equivalent of a climatological forecast. Uh, so I've just plotted the results there. Um, so the blue line is, is, is the main um, result where you can see for the severe objects, the skill um, gradually drops with lead time. And then I did a couple of experiments um, where I removed the small forecast, the really small areas. Um, and I also um, smoothed the forecast field a bit more. Um, and based on this skill score, there was um, no skill for forecasting the, the extreme objects. The skill score was, was quite negative, and that was um, largely due to the, the over forecast bias. Uh, one other thing that I did was I overlaid um, my hits, misses, and false alarms areas. Uh, so with the, the hits, you can see that um, it's fairly evenly distributed across Australia, with um, but with, with with more hits um, in the northern half of Australia. Um, misses were were relatively rare um, for the severe threshold, and for false alarms, um, we can see that there's a few interesting areas that, that that really are highlighted here. So the larger area over in the northwest. Um, th that's a huge area um, where we consistently got false alarms. And then there's a few other little bullseyes um, that, are, that I've uh, circled there, which are close to the coast in the tropics. And then repeated for the extreme threshold. So there wasn't a huge amount of extreme um, observations during the season, um, but you can see that pattern for the false alarms towards the north northwest of Australia appearing um, with, with the um, extreme forecasts. So why is the, the performance around extremes poor? Uh, well, there's a few reasons, I think. 
Um, so the 96 hour heat wave forecast includes a lead day six maximum temperature forecast. So we do have pretty good skill at lead day six, but when it comes to forecasting uh, like ex extremes, it's not as good. Um, and then the units for this heat wave index, uh, basically it's a temperature anomaly squared. So um, it becomes really difficult to, to forecast those extremes accurately. Uh, with the heat wave index, it's also relative to climatology, so only a small temperature excursion in the tropics is needed to trigger the severe threshold in, in, in the tropics. Um, and then over northwest Australia, where we were getting that um, strong false alarm signal, it does have really poor weather station uh, coverage. There's, um, there's really nothing much out there. Um, and this does impact the, the uh, accuracy of the gridded observation data set. Um, and then finally, um, there's, they're using a different gridded observation data set to train the forecast system that primarily drives the heat wave service than what's used for verification. So that could um, be the cause of, of, of some biases, um, particularly around extremes. So some of the next steps that we want to do. Uh, we'd like to repeat this over several seasons of data. I think this is really important for the extreme threshold um, since um, there weren't too many extreme cases. Uh, we could also consider uh, repeating it, the verification, but masking where the gridded observations are poorer in the northwest of Australia. Uh, with the actual service itself, we could reconsider which data um, source is used for observations. There's also uh, the possibility of doing some, some further post-processing um, and bias correction of the forecast. And I think uh, we could think about redesigning the heat wave service um, to, to um, be better for the tropics. So to summarize, we successfully got MetPlus running doing uh, object-based verification of the Bureau's heat wave forecast. And that was, um, it was a really nice use case for, for using MetPlus for the very first time. Um, we produced some area-weighted contingency tables to allow us to calculate verification scores. Um, now, I'd be interested if um, others are using the same method as what I used uh, to produce those area-weighted contingency tables, or if um, it's that's something, um, it, it, it's a new method that hasn't been used elsewhere. Um, and then I guess just reflecting on things that would have allowed me to do more in MET Plus and less writing my own Python scripts, um, support for more map projections such as the Australian projection would be really nice um, since that's a project map projection that's used commonly within the bomb. Um, if the met metadata in our net CDFs was correct to begin with, that would have um, sped up uh, the process. And finally, um, I, since I couldn't figure out a way for MET Plus to just read a single a forecast net CDF and a single observation net CDF, and I had to split it up into to many different files, it would be nice if either MET Plus, uh, if there was a way for MET Plus to read um, uh, those single files um, with with the valid times and lead time data combined, or if there was a nice tool to just uh, split up those net CDFs into uh, multiple files and save them on disk for Met Plus to read in the right format. So thanks, happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, if there's any questions, please raise your hand. We'll take them as they are. Yes, Justin. Hey, so I, I had a quick question about some of your uh, mode config file settings. Um, yep. Mostly your the, the total interest score threshold that you set to 0.75. Uh, th that yep. threshold is, is kind of what we're playing around with here at CPC as well. Um, can you just give me your thoughts around uh, why you chose 0.75 as your threshold? Yep, so the main reason is um, a whole lot of trial and error with looking at the um, output in the, the postscript files. Um, so those postscript files um, were actually, yeah, I found them really useful. And um, th that's primarily the, the main reason why it was 0.75 as, as that 
just eyeballing the results um, for a whole lot of different dates that seem to, to work best based on the, the settings I chose. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of uh, trial and error. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Justin. Any other questions for Nick? I guess I've got one question, um, which is um, around like, the method I use for the area-weighted contingency tables. I'd, I'd be um, keen to hear if anyone else um, has, has been doing that. Yes, Tar. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't see all of your presentation because I've been bopping back and forth between the two sessions. Um, but yeah, it, it, I, I'm, I'm starting to lose track of some details, um, but it, I'm pretty certain that MetViewer, um, you know, our, our one user interface, um, computes um, the area weighted uh, skill scores, um, probably similar to, to what you did. Um, it, it's just that it's, you know, embedded in, in, the, um, in the, uh, the user interface and then now MetCalcPy, um, we may have to check and see if that um, capability has been transitioned over from the R statistics um, scripts that we were using for MetViewer and into Python, into the, the um, MetCalcPy Python code. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that um, we've certainly uh, encouraged people to consider using just when you're dealing with objects. So it's great that you went that direction. Yeah, thanks, Star. I'll have to um, look into it and, and, and see if it um, already exists. Yeah, um, you know, you can always just write a, um, a question to discussions. It might be something that, um, you know, others would, would benefit from as well. Um, and then we can address it um, openly. Yep, sure, that sounds good. And then uh, just one other comment about your um, the last item that you have reading a, a single net CDF with multiple valid times lead times. Um, we are actually uh, in the process of um, adding in support to be able to handle um, uh, more complex um, indexing into net CDF files. Um, so hopefully that will address your, your need. Um, if it's if it is something that you would once again want to write to um, discussions on and provide a sample file for, um, that that um, development is actively in progress at this point, and so it might be good to have a sample file just to make sure that it, it really does address your need. Yep, sure. That, uh, yeah, that that's a good idea. Um, I'll send through a sample file. Okay. I'm done with my comments. Anybody else have any questions? <laughs> It doesn't look like it. So thank you, Nick, for the presentation. And if anybody has any further questions, please reach out to him. Uh, Tara, I think you were going to close the session. I was. Um, so uh, thanks to everyone who um, participated and, and provided presentations. I think that um, you know, we seeing what the community is doing and, and how they're using the tools, and actually um, to all of you who conformed with, you know, including the wire diagram and, and highlighting what tools you were using and, and so forth, that's, I think, just incredibly helpful to the entire community. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think that, you know, we had a really great session today. Um, and so we'll get started again tomorrow. Um, we're going to um, come together in a plenary for about 10 minutes um, tomorrow morning, 8.30 um, Mountain Time, um, 1030 Eastern Time. Um, and then um, after that, break out into parallel sessions. Um, the parallel sessions tomorrow morning um, look at how, um, you know, operational centers are, are using the, the um, MEPLUS tools in, in a little bit more detail, not necessarily the, you know, the broad um, uh, presentations that we had earlier today. And then over um, in the other break, in the other parallel session, we'll wrap up some of the S2S um, evaluation, um, as well as introduce some feature relative um, capability that uh, might be interesting for, for many um, to look for systematic errors. 
um, and so forth. Um, so see you tomorrow morning, um, at least U.S. time, and uh, everybody enjoy your time off, whether it's sleeping or um, working or just enjoying your evening. So thanks.